I think we can start. So, well, next speaker is Alessandro Spignani. And um, we go into computational uh, epidemiology. Can you share the screen, uh, Alessandro? Yes, trying to get to uh, the screen sharing part. Let me see if I have privileges. Uh, you should. Yeah. So now okay. you should see my full screen, if it's that correct. Yes, yes. OK. Um, please go ahead. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so I'm, first of all, uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, at least virtually back in Trieste. That's, uh, that was a place that really I, I, I worked at the ICTP for several years. So it's always a great uh, pleasure to, to be back. And I apologize, uh, I'm, I'm not there in person. Unfortunately, with, with COVID, uh, we have all got used to the fact that the travel are getting, uh, how to say, uh, completely changed at the last minute. Uh, also, since uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not in a great physical shape, I hope that my voice will, uh, will be functioning for the full 30 <coughs> minutes. Um, I will talk about computational epidemiology and decision making, but I want to frame this into, into the perspective of, uh, of uh, of this, uh, uh, of this conference, of this workshop. Uh, and, and, and let me start, uh, first of all, by uh, uh, acknowledging the fact that whatever I will say is actually the, 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 the work of a large number of people, uh, both uh, before the pandemic, after the pandemic, in, in, in many different ways. It's, uh, we, we have been, have been uh, lucky to team up with exceptional teams, uh, both in uh, my institution, but as well across institutions uh, across the world in institutions in Europe, uh, uh, China, uh, United States. And also I have to acknowledge the support of uh, uh, some uh, uh, data provider and, 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 and commercial companies that, that have supported uh, on the data side uh, our work. And I hope to, to show you how, how this has been done. Uh, you know, uh, framing into, into this conference, you know, I, 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 it's true. We, we, we have to take into account uh, uh, major, uh, what I would define really existential threats for us in the future. So rising inequality, demographic crisis, migration, the loss of biodiversity, and the way we interface with biodiversity in a completely different way. Uh, climate change. All those questions becomes uh, uh, a major battlefield for public health because they are going to have a huge impact on, on, on public health. And they are going to have a huge impact on infectious disease. And actually the fact that in the last 20 years we have already uh, uh, experienced uh, 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 one flu pandemic, uh, several major epidemic uh, going from SARS uh, to, to, to MERS, uh, uh, extension of, uh, of, of Ebola, uh, uh, now monkeypox, Zika. Uh, so this is all telling us that there, are, there is a lot that, that is happening. And part of this, our life and fight against infectious diseases is constant in the, in the history of humankind. But there are for sure major issues uh, uh, due to, to, to those factors. At the same time, you know, uh, we have new quantitative and, uh, and, uh, and powerful uh, uh, tools to, to, to how to say, to, to bring into the battlefield in a sense. And so we have new digital data streams and this goes from uh, environmental data, personal health devices, uh, geospatial information at all levels, uh, clinical data at a level depth and, and potential integration that is unprecedented. We have developed in many, many areas forecasting and analytical methodologies, which are completely new thanks to computational power. The, uh, integration with artificial intelligence is, is crucial. And another point that I want to mention because it's crucial and key in any discussion about uh, human, uh, human 
uh, ecologies, activities, and, and problems is the, 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 the misinformation, the contrast to misinformation, and what we can do in terms of the correct messaging uh, for policies. And, 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 uh, and, and, and this is also where uh, science is advancing a lot. At the same time, you know, uh, we see that to have an impact, we have to transform those concepts into actionable. Uh, uh, modeling and, and here I will dive a little bit into infectious diseases. So uh, we want to have a, a kind of models that is we can use to define policies to, to, to change what, what, what we experience in the world for the better. And, uh, and uh, I don't want to advocate for any, <coughs> I'm sorry, for any specific approach uh, or uh, 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 I would say way of tackling those problems. But you know, for sure what we need is interpretability. Um, and, and we can achieve uh, this through mechanistic approach, the, you know, the classic equation-based understanding that we have, but also through machine learning and artificial intelligence. But it is crucial that we don't just play with black boxes. We need to have control on initial conditions and prediction limits of what we do. We don't have just the, 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 the forecast, but we need to have uh, and to manage uh, uh, the confidence uh, that we have in any uh, of our uh, uh, scientific approach uh, to, the, to, to, to those problems. And, you know, in, in, in infectious disease, uh, the last 20 years have been quite transformative, mostly because of the data and the data capabilities that, that we have. First of all, we have uh, complete different uh, capabilities in uh, genome sequencing, uh, uh, the idea that we can use phylogenetic in a complete different way. We have human uh, mobility data and information that are completely unprecedented, from the large-scale mobility of people to the local fine print of, of, of what we do and how we meet. And then a huge amount of data that goes uh, in terms of population, demographic data that now, and, and let's be honest, this is not just because we collect those data, but also because we have the capabilities through, again, computational approaches like machine learning, like artificial intelligence to, you know, combine data sources like, you know, satellite light emission captured by satellites with, with census data and so on and so forth. So all those data have transformed the way that we can model infectious diseases. And here I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to give you an example of, of more or less what are the schemes and the resolution we can work with. First of all, we, we, we have always a kind of multi-scale problem because we, we have different layers of data that should be integrated when we, we do this kind of uh, highly detailed models. And, and one is the population. And then we have the mobility. And mobility is at different scales. So different scales means from the local commuting patterns to the more long range transfer uh, international uh, travel and the geographic resolution that we can achieve uh, with different uh, uh, modeling approaches is, is really changing. We can look at the world at a global level or just zoom in on, into a specific urban area. And depending on where you are, the data that you have, you can use different uh, resolutions and different methodology. Uh, you can use more coarse grain approaches, uh, uh, age stratified uh, contact patterns or go into the more la la last generation uh, uh, multiplex, uh, multiplex or multi-scale network that actually are some kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, agent-based model on steroids. To do that, you need to collect a lot of information. So the, the, to construct this, uh, the, 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 how to say, the background for those models is uh, starts from microcensus data. That means that you look at uh, uh, data that really collect very detailed uh, information about single households. You resample those single households to create in each uh, uh, geographical area your uh, your uh, synthetic population that has to respect the macroscopic statistical properties like you know age structure or family composition and so on and so forth. And so at the end of all that, you have to include also workplace, schools, et cetera. You generate synthetic population that then you can coarse grain 
at the level that you want. For instance, you can use a mesoscopic description. As we say, that means that you have age stratified contact patterns. So what is the probability of an individual of 10 years old to be in contact with another 10 years old or 20 years old, 40 years old, and so on and so forth. And these are all stratified according to the settings. Those settings are changing by specific, uh, uh, the specific disease that you are looking at. And here, it's important to keep in mind that there is no solution that fits all diseases. Uh, uh, respiratory diseases have typical uh, household, school, workplace, community settings, uh, while if you work for other diseases, you need to uh, take into account the specific uh, mode of transmission that could be, for instance, a nosocomial or could be in a specific uh, strata of the population. When you have all that, you model the infection transmission on these, uh, on, on these, uh, uh, in these synthetic populations. And uh, these, if you go for mechanistic uh, uh, approaches, you can, I would say, look at those systems always like what we call kind of metapopulation models. So kind in the sense that the, the, you have a large network where each node specify uh, a subpopulation. And this subpopulation could be uh, a small rural area or a county or a urban area or even a, a, a country in itself. So the, the, it depends on the scale. You have a mechanistic description of the disease internally that could be very complex. This is an example of what you would do, for instance, for COVID-19, in which you have to take into account a symptomatic individual, symptomatic individuals, hospitalization. And then you have uh, what is the diffusion of individuals in this metapopulation network. Uh, but the diffusion is not the classic, uh, how to say, random diffusion that in many uh, cases we have been used as a toy models, but actually it's diffusion that is driven by data. So is uh, our mobility patterns that we record, record, uh, record from, uh, from, from data, uh, it could be long range by the international uh, transportation, uh, and you can get real time data uh, that really maps uh, every single flight uh, on, on Earth uh, down to the level of the commuting patterns uh, in, uh, when you drop your kids to school. Uh, just to give you an example, for instance, this is a, uh, one of the models that we uh, have used during the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, pandemic for the United States. Uh, here, each uh, county of the United States is a single node of this network, this metapopulation, and then is connected with all the other possible nodes in the system through those long range and short range commuting patterns. And then you have to take into account that in each county, these layers of population that will provide the mesoscopy or, or the single individual level description are changing because it depends if it's a rural area, if it's a, uh, if it's a urban area, what is the demographic of, 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 each, uh, of each of the county. And they are even just looking only at the United States, uh, very different. So you see that we need to collect those, those data. The understanding this problem, like the, the infectious disease modeling is, is something that is, uh, requires a lot of context and quantitative data. And the disease, i just showing you that in one second to flash out that when then you have multiple variants of a disease and many, many other, uh, other things, you just uh, get, uh, get very complex model. This is just for the history of the disease. So all these compartments and the question is like if you would work in a homogeneous population, actually what you work is with stochastic uh, uh, models at the, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, preserve the discrete nature of individuals. It's all uh, very, very uh, computationally expensive. Uh, this can be even more complex if we look at other kinds of diseases. I don't wanna keep you, uh, I'll just say, to, although we are all, uh, to say now fixing our uh, focus on, on COVID, that there are other things. This is, for instance, Zika. Zika is, is a major epidemic that occurred in the Americas in, in 2016. And uh, the disease, whoever needs a vector, needs a, a basically a mosquito that uh, you know, gets infected, biting a human that is infected, and then biting another human, transmit the disease to the 
to, to uh, across the population. Now, mosquitoes do not travel a lot, but humans travel. At this point, it's not just a matter of, of uh, uh, um, I would say the, 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 the human to human interaction, but it's the human mosquito interaction. And as well, you know, you have to consider, for instance, yeah, while a disease, uh, if you're a carrier of, the, of a disease and you travel somewhere, you could generally see the disease. This is not the case. If you are infected with Zika, but then you travel to Norway, since the, there is no mosquito population abundance there that favor this, uh, this vector uh, borne disease spreading, uh, there is no problem. Instead, if you travel from Brazil to Colombia, yeah, you are going to, uh, to see the population. And then you have to consider uh, climate, temperature, you know, the mosquito life cycle. Uh, you have to consider that uh, climate changes are changing the landscape of vector-borne diseases. So the area which are more and more at risk of uh, experiencing outbreak of those diseases are changing and actually at a quite face, uh, fast pace. And then you have economy. You know, if you are in an area of Brazil and you are a downtown a major metropolitan area and you live in a skyscraper that is as air conditioning, your exposure to mosquito is zero basically virtually. But then if you move <clears throat> just a few miles, perhaps you are instead in a high exposure with no mosquito nets and so on and so forth. And so economy and, and the uh, uh, information on the economy of the society uh, is, is crucial. So to integrate that in the model, it's really not, not an easy uh, uh, fit, but can be done. For instance, this is a, uh, mosquito abundance uh, at cell level. Uh, for Aedes aegypti, uh, and you see that now, and again, this is thanks to entomological data and uh, mosquito traps, basically, but as well machine learning that provides those wonderful uh, maps. You have climate data and, and, and meteorological data, all the resolutions that, that we need, and at the end, you have a model that becomes as like the one that I was mentioning before with those meta population, but then the meta population model zoom in into geographical resolution that are more uh, uh, at finer scale because you have to consider, for instance, the level of urbanization and the abundance of mosquitoes. And then also you have econo economical data that tells you, you know, what is the risk of exposure and what kind of urban development you have there. You sum up all those layers of data. And then you transform those in equations with uh, effective coupling terms. It, all it has to be, uh, to be uh, calibrated on the data. And uh, actually, this is work that has been done in 2016 by several uh, teams in separate to, to, to try to get a hold of the, uh, of the understanding of the spread of, of, of Zika. So you see here is where you have this interface between, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, mosquitoes, humans, economy, everything is has to be packed together if you want really to reach some understanding, quantitative understanding. And this is even more if we zoom in a, a little more and then, for instance, want to understand what happens into, into those uh, population network in urban level. If you want to understand an epidemic in, in a specific urban area, you have to, to work in the specific urban area and get a flavor, for instance, this is why I'm talking about network and I'm giving you an example. What we start is, is, is uh, where we are starting from is, is the, the census data, those household construction, the workplace, the school, etc. And then you generate bipartite networks that gives you location and opportunities of spreading for, for, for people by meeting those people or being in the same environment. And then you can do United Party projections and get a network like this one in which each uh, edge of the network has a different probability of transmission because the transmission of a disease is different in different settings. Or you can work with something more complex like multiplex network in which each layer of those networks are, uh, uh, are a specific setting. Individuals are not 
uh, on all settings uh, and not on all layers, but then they connect layers and the disease can jump and transmit from layer to layer because of the, the contact that individuals uh, on, uh, can, can bring uh, to, to, to the different uh, uh, transmission settings. And this can be analyzed as well, as well in time. If we want to go down to that level, because we want to understand the, the epidemic spreading in New York, what we need is mobility data, location data, uh, stratify those by uh, gender, age, uh, occupation, and also that has to be longitudinal because we act on, on diseases by imposing our uh, mitigation uh, policies. Uh, this is where you need to get and access another frontier in, in terms of data. Um, here, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to show you, for instance, the Boston area starting in uh, uh, basically January uh, 2020. And, and you see this is uh, the percent of typical uh, contact, the mobility range, the commute volume of people. And you see here in real time in the city of Boston what happened during the pandemic of COVID-19. You see that we go into a stationary, we have a more or less stationary state. There, there was some peak and bumps and these are due to the fact that there were the, 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 the holiday breaks uh, in, uh, in early uh, January. Uh, and then there is the huge drop due to the, to the, to the various policies adopted to con contrast COVID in, uh, in the urban area. Well, those little dots on the maps are specific census tract. So that means that you can really look at what is the change that each policy has created depending on income, depending on socioeconomic status, and many other indicators that characterize the population of, and the, the connectivity of, of, of the urban area of, of the city. Well, these data are thanks to, to, to a, a location uh, uh, intelligence provider, Cubic, that uh, has made available those data for, for good, as we say in a program, data for good. But there are many other uh, providers that did that. And I think this is extremely important because that was one of the major barriers in many in many of our approaches to understand uh, uh, infectious disease spreading and public health problems that now hope, hopefully uh, going through the trauma trauma of, 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 uh, of the pandemic, uh, a lot of infrastructures and pipeline have been generated to handle those data in a privacy preserving way so that can be used for scientific purposes. And here you see a lot of interesting things like, for instance, uh, the percent of typical contact uh, never goes back to the, to, 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 to after also when, when, when things were relaxed, it goes back to the, to the, uh, uh, to the stationary state pre-pandemic. And then you see that the commute volume actually remains always very low, although the, 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 the mobility range instead uh, increased. And so there are a lot of information to unpack that are relevant both for infectious diseases, public health, and other, other problems. Well, this kind of computational epidemiology has to be done at scale because you, know, you can write all these codes and pipeline. Uh, and if you do a simple model, uh, even with all the data that you ingest, you can be and, and do one simulation in, uh, in one minute or two, a couple of minutes. But then when you work for real, you have to calibrate models, each simulation can take up to a few hours. And that's you know, something that requires specific uh, machines. Uh, require a specific pipeline for the data analysis and the output data size and the way you deal with that is, uh, is depends on, on, on what you are trying to describe. So when we are in the real world, this means also that we have a computational power. And that's again, another dimension of this interdisciplinarity. If we get, go up to the scale and you know, in many areas like climate, meteorology, uh, weather, etc. This has been is a process where they are 50 years ahead of us in a, in a, in a sense, and they know how much it is important, the, 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 the computational part. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, the work that we did, uh, we have, we are really working with terabyte of data and, and you have to design things which uh, are 
specifically tailored around the problem. I don't want to get too much into the technical side of this, but you have a computational engine and the only way to overcome the, the, <clears throat> the problem in, of running time and the fact that you have to produce generally analysis on a short time during, during uh, health emergencies, you know, means that you have to run thousands of machines in parallel. So you have to use cloud computing, you have to use uh, cloud storage and, uh, and uh, you know, your results before can really be action at the, at the end of the pipeline really uh, are going through a very large computational, uh, computational effort of which the big problem, as you all can imagine, is the calibration, because uh, uh, the, the, the problem is uh, how we deal with, uh, with those models that are stochastic, that have priors for many of the quantities that are statistically distributed. And so what we have to do is to explore those initial conditions, those priors, define also what are the modeling assumptions, and then calibrate those data with respect to the evidence. The calibration could be done in many different ways. For instance, we use, and I'll give you an example here, this is the approximate Bayesian computation, but there are ma many, many other possible techniques that at the end can be used by, how to say, to generate from your ensemble of simulations what is your, your outcome and your confidence interval on the outcome. Uh, <clears throat> this brings us into the scenario of modeling and forecasts. Those pipelines are done to generate different uh, uh, vision of, of the future in, in infectious diseases. For instance, you can do short-term forecast one week ahead, or you can look instead at scenarios that project into three or, or, or six months ahead. But you, know, you have to be careful. You know, the, the one week ahead prediction are based on status quo or information that are available and can be integrated in the model while the scenarios are made on assumptions, on things that are very far and generally are not at all forecast in the sense that no real curve will be, uh, I would say, uh, uh, very similar to those scenario forecasts. Those scenario forecasts are made to envelop and to provide the possible map of the future that helps the reasoning for policy making. On the one week ahead to four weeks ahead, instead, the hope is to really get something that is a little bit more, I would say, uh, as close as possible to reality. So these are two different exercises that also with the policy makers are done in different, uh, different ways. I will just go back to this in a short time. Uh, everybody always talk about forecast. I wanna spend here again, uh, one minute just to say that is modeling and, and our way of approaching quantitative and actionable infectious disease modeling is much more than forecast. There is situational awareness, intervention planning, uh, structure reasoning, that means uh, endless counterfactual uh, to, 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 to try to understand what's going on in the system. And you know, the situational awareness is particularly important. For instance, uh, uh, the initial stage of, uh, of, of the pandemic, uh, when testing was not available, we all know now that, uh, that, that there was cryptic transmission. So actually the disease was, uh, was spreading in the population, but it was not measured. And so while in Europe or United States, there were a handful of cases uh, uh, officially notified, we had thousands of transmission per day by end of February in each of those uh, geographical areas. And, uh, and this is something that with the model you can do. So the model we're telling policymakers, uh, look, we have this, you, you, it's, it's not measured, but it's there. And it's, you know, the pandemic is inevitable. We have to move in, into, 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 into from, how to say, the containment in China to mitigation and so on and so forth. So there was really impact. And, uh, and the same is, uh, for instance, if you look at where the cases were coming from, if you, again, this is very difficult, phylogenetic uh, uh, analysis can help a lot, but you know, also here you access uh, through simulations uh, and using evidence uh, from, from, from real data, uh, maps of uh, how importation sources have contributed to the seeding of the epidemic in different areas. And you see that the emerging picture is very different than, how to say the, 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 the classic narrative. So China as, as the culprit or Europe as the culprit. You see that, for instance, for most of the United States and Europe, 
most of the circulation of the virus has been domestic. So within the countries and the states of these two geographical areas that have contributed to seeding uh, uh, the epidemic there. <clears throat> so how these uh, approaches has worked in, in early pandemic months, uh, I would say that especially at the beginning, uh, they raised very important flags. Uh, they quantified the extent of the epidemic in China before we had the capabilities to do that. Uh, projection of epidemic dispersal were very early, early, early February in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the timeline. And the evidence of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission, the early estimates of infection fatality rates, uh, the, the, you know, a lot of uh, important information was available basically in the first uh, few weeks of this pandemic, uh, thanks to quantitative modeling uh, happening in, in, in real time. And here I'm talking about the work of a community and, uh, and of really many groups. Um, uh, however, at a certain point, you know, it is, it is very relevant to talk about what is, I call the policy intelligence disconnect. Uh, those re red flags were not isolated with the blower narratives, were actually a group of uh, coordinated groups uh, of, uh, of scientists that were saying what, what, what was the thing. So, but, you know, they were not acted upon. And mostly because of some fallacies. So, past history-based thinking. So it was very difficult to think of COVID initially as something different from SARS or the flu. That was always, you know, the two cornerstones uh, and, and actually was something completely different. The other problem was no action under uncertainties and, and also the hubris that sometime you have when, uh, when you think about, uh, about, okay, this is happening in China, it's not happening in other places. And again, here is where you know, having a, a, a different perspective into human ecology is uh, much more open-minded that would, would, would benefit. But the problem of no action under uncertainty is something very, very important. Uh, I, I, I report here something that a governor said in the United States, and I want to say who he is uh, or she is. Uh, decisions should be based on things that actually happen and not the result of some mathematical equation. Actually, I have to be honest, this was not told by uh, policymakers in an aggressive way. It was more a kind of desperate thing. So I, you know, we need to shut down cities and, and, uh, and this is just in, uh, the, in models and we don't yet see what, what's going on. Uh, however, there are two fallacies in this reasoning. One is that in our world, uh, we, takes, we take endless decisions based on equations, actually, and uh, uh, just look at whether uh, whether wise uh, 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 like the evacuation of cities no in for for hurricanes uh, and then also that generally acting just on the base of what actually happens at that very moment means that you are acting too late and so one of the problem was that uh, you know for many of the problems we are discussing in this uh, uh, in this conference uh, uh, we are in a situation very different from the classic example of the hurricane. The hurricane for policymakers, uh, it's tangible. Although it is this, the trajectory and, 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 and the information is provided is based on equations, if you want, and models, you know, you have also the satellite uh, photo of, of the big hurricane. With many of the problems that we're dealing with in infectious diseases, one, we don't have that satellite picture. You might have a model that tells, you know, you have thousands of transmission, but still the hospitals are not reporting those, those cases. And so you see that this is a major problem in our way of communicating things. And the other is uncertainty. And I have to, here again, I, I, I want to give uh, in one minute an example that is very recent. This was a blizzard on the East Coast in January, the past January. On one side, you see the European forecast, model and on another side, the American forecast model for who knows about uh, uh, weather forecast, you know, that these are two of the major models used. Both of them were uh, in agreement uh, for a major blizzard and no storm hitting the East Coast. But then if you look, for instance, at the area of New York, you have uh, that in New York City, the forecast of the two models were differing by 20 inches. 
So 20 inches in terms of policy making, as you can imagine, is, is, is the world. Because what do you do? Uh, one inch of snow, you don't do anything. At 20 inches of snow, you have to mobilize an entire city, close it down, etc. So how we, uh, why we are, in a sense, you know, in, in meteorology, we are used to this thing. And indeed, we don't, we act upon those models. Why? Because actually, we know that models are not oracles. The results vary from model to model. There are not always optimal performance of a model in a specific uh, uh, situation. And what we do is exactly what we call multimodal forecast. We do the super ensemble of, uh, of different models. And so we go more and more into situation in which, okay, this is our forecast. That is the aggregation of this seemingly mess of different results from different models. And so this is unfortunately, while in some areas, uh, and I'm talking about again, weather, climate, et cetera, this has been done and there is a long tradition. This is much less so in, uh, uh, or been in many other areas and in infectious diseases for sure. Indeed, we did start to use ensemble approach and super ensemble approach during COVID, both for the short term prediction and the long term scenarios. And you see, these are major efforts in which we really need to change our perspective on how we do science on those topics. And it was done on the run because of the emergencies of COVID. There were initiatives also before COVID and actually these things uh, at the Center for Disease Control happen piggybacking on experience, for instance, with the flu and so on and so forth. But this is important because it's telling you that, uh, uh, that this is the way that we need to move for many of those problems. We can't uh, going on, uh, I think, uh, and this is my conclusion with, uh, in many cases, an academic model that doesn't work for major, major uh, societal problems. Uh, you know, this is a sentence by, I think, by Sam Scarpino, if I'm not wrong, in which uh, in an interview say, you know, when you have again approaches these costs, you don't ask randomly modelers uh, what they should do and, and uh, what they see. Uh, drop what you're doing and, and, and please create a model. No, you know, we have national, the National Center for Hurricane Forecast and so on, so prediction and so on and so forth. So I think for many of the challenges we are facing and, and we are discussing in this day, we need to overcome the academic model, goes into single, from single teamwork, competition, elite publication model, lack of dependability of what we do and reproducibility in many cases to coordination, collaboration, best practices, uh, data sharing uh, uh, in a way that is completely new, that really becomes a, 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 new, uh, a, a new way of, of, of uh, approaching uh, our problems. And although it seems from, from the outside that we're already uh, alpha way, I don't think so. And the COVID-19 has been a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, good example of how much we, we have to progress into, into this direction. Uh, I think I can stop here to, so that we have a few uh, minutes for questions that I would be very happy to, uh, to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so uh, any question? Ah, so, uh, Simon. Yeah, so thanks very much for, for, for your talk. I, I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, agent-based models for infectious diseases. Obviously, um, agent-based models are part of the story, but there's, there, uh, you know, there's so much, so, so much freedom there in terms of what you put in that um, I think you're, some sort of multi-model approach out is, is essential for reducing the dimensionality. So what, what are your views on the role of uh, agent-based models? I think this is, okay, first of all, thanks for the, this is a great question. And uh, I, I think uh, that there are two answers to this question. First of all, I wanted to present a spectrum of approaches uh, and uh, 
you have to calibrate the, the kind of approach to the questions and the stage uh, of, uh, of the, the, of the uh, how to say, the, 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 the process that you are. So for instance, agent-based model cannot be used at the very early stage when you don't have even basic information or the, 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 the level of knowledge of transmissions mechanism is very limited. Uh, in many other cases, they might not be computationally ideal in settings where that information, again, is, is foggy, the data are not high quality. I think in some of the uh, um, of, of our countries, like, you know, for instance, United States and Europe, but the level of data that you can achieve now allows you to really reduce drastically the number of parameters. So in a sense, your synthetic population is data driven and you are left with a few parameters like the transmissibility of the disease, but you look at how much time people are spending in their home dwelling, uh, how much uh, uh, if they uh, meet in Starbucks or uh, in a restaurant. And, and so you can do really a lot. But I agree there is the problem of finding always the right dimensionality reduction and also to have something that is uh, validated and so i would say that that's that's the other major problem you know using a, an agent based model is wonderful fantastic but then hmm, how you validate the results that you see at the level of single i say you know there is much more transmission in restaurants than in uh, in schools hmm, okay how you then <laughs> validate that and so i i totally agree one has to be very very careful on 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 the more you zoom in and the more you need to have a perimeter and to have uh, uh, to have validation data and i think this is part of the work that has to be done during the peace time so to prepare for that and especially i think agent based models are very useful for specific questions like uh, what if I close a school in this place for those days uh, and I have very good data on, on that area. I think at the global level, uh, you you know, many other coarse grain approximation could, could work and provide uh, uh, the, the same quality of response actually even, uh, even, uh, even with less uncertainty. Do you think there's the potential for, uh, for example, for creating a functional taxonomy of cities based on things like degree distributions or something of that sort? I think yes. I think this is what we experience in the United States. I think it can be done in Europe. When you have those data at the level of census tract, uh, the census tract is associated even without doing, uh, how to say, privacy intr intrusive uh, uh, studies, you know, provide you a lot of information, a lot of information that can generate uh, uh, information on this deep, you can stratify in almost virtually endless way the, the, the population in those uh, at, at this level. And it could be done, you know, because you see that uh, Seattle is very different than New York. Actually, New York is a city per se, <laughs> always, you know, with kind of uh, different than anything else you see. And uh, that Boston, then, 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 then Miami. I, here is where we need the support as a community, the scientific community, from the, the, the data uh, uh, providers. Uh, we need to, to really generate those taxonomy. We need to get those weather stations in place. Uh, we need to have those prices, see, preserving pipeline in place. Uh, and I think it can be done. It's, it's really a lot, a lot of work more, but it should be done. Thank you. And just to mention, you know, that the, the, the Center for Disease Control now has, has, a, has a new center for uh, outbreak analytic and, and, and forecast uh, uh, directed now by Mark Lipsich that I think is working in a sense to, toward ideas of, of that, that kind. I, my, my hope is that the, this will happen in many other countries and, uh, and, uh, and across the world. Any other question? Yeah, so, so you were mentioning at the beginning uh, the, the issue of data availability and the fact that uh, you, uh, some of the data that you used uh, were uh, private from some uh, companies. And um, so I was wondering, uh, say, and on the other hand, you have privacy issues. So, uh, I was wondering uh, um, what are the constraints? I mean, on one, on one hand on, say, privacy issue, on the other hand on 
um, economic costs. I mean, uh, if if you have to pay for well, you know, uh, for the, I, this is another good question. There are different uh, uh, phases to the, the problem of data. First one is uh, uh, some of the data that we use are are just uh, available, but at a very high cost. For instance, you want to buy the airline data, you just have to buy. And, and we have to buy, we, since many years, they cost a lot. So that's one problem. And there is a, is a situation in which you would like to lower the barrier for the scientific community. Then there is the data about single individuals. There, there are privacy issues, but as well, there are costs involved for the companies. So now the companies, uh, and I'm talking about the big providers, all from Facebook, uh, Cubic, uh, uh, Google, during the pandemic, they were very helpful. They just brought uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, teams working on those data, making them available to the scientific community. But there is a cost involved for the company because these are basically they have to generate those privacy preserving pipeline they have to to you know to have people working inside those providers so that we can then access the data in a safe way and this is something that is is a cost and so again we need to generate brokers that are able to uh, to to provide resources to keep this process alive also when covid will not be anymore in on 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 the radar and that's that's uh, that's crucial then we have public health data human data we need to go back and fund the public health we need to collect more data we need to create ways to to access a clinical record also in that area, that this is even more delicate in a privacy preserving way. Uh, all that as a, as a cost, also in terms of software development, how you can interface different databases. And then you just can imagine what is going to happen in the next few years when everybody will have a watch measuring temperature, pressure, and heart rate. And this is a a gold mine of data that can be used, also stratified by, by uh, socioeconomic status, uh, gender, age indicators, etc., that could enrich so much what, 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 what we do. Uh, but we need, we need to have a plan for that and not wait for the next emergency to strike. Uh, uh, Joel, uh, you want also to make a question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, very thoughtful and uh, helpful overview. In one slide, you showed the 20-inch difference in <laughs> precipitation between the American model and the European model for the East Coast. And that is useful to show the margin of uncertainty depending on the assumptions made by the different groups. In a later slide, you uh, promoted the advantages of integrating research groups instead of having single investigators going their own way, coming up with disparate projections. And I see a tension between the advantages of diverse forecasts and the necessity of large teams working to come up with an integrated multi-model forecast. I don't see a discussion of how you manage that trade-off or what to, how should I think about that? If you have thoughts about yeah. it, I'd like to hear them. Yeah, well, this is a very good question in the sense that you say, well, on one side, you see that the models provide that diversity. You need to value that diversity because that tells you about, you know, what level of uh, uncertainties you have depending on, on assumptions. At the same time, uh, you want to get something that is actionable. And if you put all together, the fear is that you have a herding effect in which at the end, uh, you, in a sense, you wash out the diversity. And the process, in, yeah, the process indeed that we used was, uh, in, in our experience uh, with COVID, was to have the different teams to work independently and produce their own forecast. And so we are not working together to generate a single model, but each one of us work with its own model. And then there is a third party, in a sense, is that the CDC and the other teams that are doing the aggregation by using ensemble and super ensemble approaches uh, 
so that at the end uh, you generate from those model uh, uh, an output uh, that takes into account uh, though that, that diversity. This is crucial. So the ensemble model and super ensemble model that are generated are not washing out that uncertainty. Actually, our problem now is that being respectful of that uncertainty, those models have always large confidence intervals. Um, and, and it's crucial that you avoid any, any herding effects. However, for COVID, I just can give you the scale of the effort. That means that you have 20, 25 modeling teams working independently that have to be supported. And then there is another group of people at the CDC and another group of modelers that actually are statisticians that assemble that, that information. And so that's a large scale effort. It's the only way that we can, we can move forward. On that sense, I have to really rely on, uh, on the experience that has been done in, uh, in, uh, in weather and, and climate where there is a lot of, uh, of really, they are decades ahead of us in, in, in doing that. But uh, we need to be mindful of what you say. So you want to, uh, to keep the diversity and it's, it's crucial. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's a major point. Okay, so thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions, then uh, we thank again uh, Alessandro for this nice talk.